now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Today, I will be talking about the esoteric messiah, the esoteric preacher. Uh, in a way, this is similar to what Eve Lorgan talked about uh, regarding the new guru, the new guru parasite, but I'm going to go into more detail about a particular type of esoteric preacher, esoteric messiah. Uh, because we, we, we see these characters in the field. And what they're doing is conducting a pacification program. What pacification is, it, there's different facets to it. But basically to pacify the target audience. They would send out these people, civilians, oftentimes CIA operatives, into the villages in Vietnam and they would attempt to pacify the the villagers you know con them with uh inoculations with medicine with medical treatment digging wells uh civil affairs civil task kind of thing but really it's to get them on side really to tell them that we're doing this to protect you from the VC uh protect you and put you under government protection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But really, they're just trying to get these people under their control. And so we see a similar form of pacification with some of these esoteric messiahs, esoteric preachers. These people come at you with a religious zeal, f- fired by a religious zeal. They have a lot of esoteric jargon, much of which they create on their own. And because they speak in almost exclusively in esoteric terms, they'll throw in bits and pieces about the New World Order, about mind control, about AI, uh, you know, the hot-button topics that uh, we are familiar with in our field. They'll throw in enough of these hot-button topics, tie it all in together, repackage information that they've gleaned elsewhere, and then repackage it and present it as their own. And their message is they're right, everyone else is wrong, everyone else is using the wrong terminology, everyone else is going about it wrong, I'm the only one who's right about this, and it's a constant steady drumbeat of this esoteric jargon, and because so much of it is esoteric, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to substantiate any of their claims. Uh, Another facet of of their spiel and their shtick is that they will give you all these examples every once in a while of their personal experiences and usually there's a very large element of grandiosity, very large element of self-aggrandizement as if they themselves are standing up to the entire Draco Empire but really what they've done is in order to add a personal touch They've created some of these stories out of whole cloth, mixed it into the esoteric jargon spiel, just to add that personal element, just to add that aspect of, I've walked the walk, I've done it, I've been there, I know what I'm talking about. But in intelligence terms, it's non-confirmable data. There's no way to confirm if what they're talking about has actually happened to them, and by dint of the fact that many of these people have an authoritative air to them, that they can speak breathlessly, nonstop, for hours on end, and I'll get into this, for those who are weak-minded, for those who have holes in their auric field, because a lot of these esoteric messiahs, esoteric preachers, they ooze all this excess energy, which is deliberate, because it becomes all-encompassing to the the listeners, the people in their presence. And the people either soak it up if they don't have proper auric shields and defenses, or if there's holes in their auric fields, all this energy being exuded by the esoteric messiah, the esoteric preacher, it finds cracks, holes in the auric shields, and thereby infects the 
the listeners, uh, the captive audience, if you will. I'm going to go into detail about all of this point by point because it's important. There's people in the field like this, males and females, even people that are coming from a heart-centered place uh, or what seems to be a heart-centered place. Their egos are activated and they're just on this religious missionary job to convert others it's very much like religious missionaries so i just wanted to give you a heads up about what i'll be discussing today just getting over about with a chem flu i knocked it out with natural means i took some zinc powder and uh, did some other things and i'm on the mend which is good so every once in a while i have to pause this recording as i take a breath uh, because don't want to get the anti-breathers on my back again. So just bear in mind that I'm getting over this bug, that I've just come back from the Coffs Harbor Conference a couple of weeks back and still recovering from that. And and we'll do our level best to get the, the podcast out on time and then some. I put some extras out there. Got some surprises in store for you folks to our dear, dedicated uh, listeners and members. Okay, the esoteric missionary. The esoteric missionary is powered by a religious fervor, and they utilize esoteric jargon, uh, much of which they created on their own. And they're very big on Oh, the proper usage of terms. Oh, you can't say things that way because you're invoking bad things that were set in motion in the ether like millions of years ago or because that term is so loaded through uh, religion, through religiosity, through the God spell, etc., etc. So right from the outset, they don't even want you to speak in the normal way you speak, right? So... They, tr- they are very big in correcting the behavior of others. Uh, and they do it in a fear-based way. Like, if you say things in a certain way, because it was first created, uh, this term, way back when, uh, in some kind of Saturn-controlled court of law or whatever, and they don't even go into specifics a lot of times. They'll just throw out some kind of, you know, aside or something to justify what they're saying. If you use terms which they, the committee of they, have created, and then you're falling into all of their soul agreement traps, you're falling into all of their uh, forms of manipulation, you're finding yourself uh, caught up in these binding soul arrangements simply by the things you say. I don't give in to that kind of fear because I have a destiny to fulfill and it doesn't matter how I say certain things. Right, because that's a big part of this fear based programming. Because, like all religions, controlling religions, so much of it is based on fear. And you know, I think decades ago, and I've been around Jordan Maxwell, and he talked about the power of words and the origins of words and the etymology and the roots of words. And I respect his work, and he was one of the first ones to really make a point of telling people where so much of the language has come from, how it comes from this cult of Saturn control system, this Luciferian Talmudic control system. And I appreciate his work. Uh, Another person that's made a point of talking about the origins of of words and the origins of symbols, uh, along with Jordan Maxwell, was, was Freeman Fly. He's done a great job of that. So I understand that concept, right? But I'm not held in thrall to it. Right? For example, if I want to buy a Christmas tree, which I haven't done in ages, but if I want to buy a Christmas tree because it's Christmas time, I don't need some unhealed religious esoteric fanatic chirping at me, going on and on and on about, oh, the Christmas tree is a phallic symbol, it represents a ball, and it's all about the winter solstice and you know the three days when the sun is below the the visible horizon i know all that i don't need people preaching to me i want a christmas tree because it makes me feel good 
and it makes the people around me feel good because they want a Christmas tree. And I'm not going to sit there and hector and badger the people. Okay, you know where this Christmas tree came from? Here, I'm going to rain on your parade. I'm going to ruin your holidays because I'm going to talk about this really dark stuff about Christmas trees, right? And I'm just giving you an example where I'm using a Christmas tree example. I haven't bought a Christmas tree in ages, and I don't really have, you know, the inclination to do so, you know, anytime soon. Maybe next year. If Kylie and I talk about it and we want to pose next to a Christmas tree and put presents under it and whatnot, we'll do it. But we're not going to do it in fear. Like, oh, should we be doing this? Are we paying homage to Baal? Are we paying homage to the dark gods of you know the past and, and all this stuff? You get a lot of that, right? Some people arm themselves with just enough knowledge about these esoteric issues to be annoying, quite frankly, right? So the religious missionary, the religious uh, esoteric messiah, the esoteric messenger, they are all of this wrapped up in one. And so what will happen is they'll pop up in the field the YouTube search algorithms drive all kinds of uh, viewers to their site. They jack up their views. This is a common tactic they do with a lot of people all across the board. You, you want to drive people, viewers, to the bogus MyLabs and the, you know, the, the bozo, the clown uh, sideshow, circus, sideshow circus I talked about in the MyLab field. Well, the search engines will drive people to those sites, right, where people are just talking about all kinds of stuff and and getting back to the esoteric aspect to, to it, the esoteric aspect is the underpinning. It's what holds together the whole spiel because, again, there's nothing you can really sink your teeth into. When I gave a lecture at Coffs Harbor, I was asked to talk about the secret space program, but what I did to give a healthy dose of realism to the subject is, and I talked about this in a previous commentary, members only, I think, I talked about how a secret society, uh, rather a secret space program, likely got off the ground, pun intended. And I, I took it back to the basics. In, in math, they always teach you simplify, simplify, simplify. So I talk about the secret society, the, the court of the dragon, the serpent brotherhood, underpinning all of this. I talk about the uh, the early crash retrievals, the back engineering, the extreme secrecy, the crash programs to develop this back engi this back engineered technology to eventually come up with their own offensive weapon systems, to come up with their own means of uh, not, not only flight in the atmosphere, but uh, interplanetary flight, interstellar flight, interdimensional flight. I go at it step by step in a very believable way, right? And I talked about how there would have been, and there have been known to be, aliens that survived some of these crashes, and how the aliens would have been debriefed, and what they would have wanted to know about the alien society, uh, what their civilization was like. Is, is there a division of labor in these alien civilizations? Like, who does what? Is there a hierarchy? These are things that... An intelligence analyst would want to know, and the intelligence analyst would be getting information or questions from these teams of, of scholars and think tanks. Okay, ask them this, ask them that. What they're doing is they're painting a picture, a mosaic, piece by piece, by debriefing these aliens that survived these crashes or uh, craft that have been shot down. And then eventually, over time, these alliances were formed. Because they realized there were these civilizations already living underground, had been here all along. They known they known that through the study of the ancient lore and what the, the indigenous peoples have been saying all along. And so I I bring the audience up to the point where, okay, here's Ben Rich talking about how the military is already traveling the stars. So I do it stage by stage. How could this have come into play? What kinds of mechanisms? What kinds of infrastructure would have been required to create a secret space program? It's better to do it that way, I feel, than to just to suddenly start talking about being a super soldier on Mars and, and doing this, that, and the other. And, and there's nothing to back up what I say 
Everything is is like woo woo. Everything is esoteric. You just have to just take it on word, right? But the difference between the way I approach it is, I take it from a fact based perspective, a fact based template, and then I debrief. A lot of people I've developed rapport, trust, mutual trust with who have actually walked the walk. Real my labs. People who've really been to Mars. People who've really been to the moon. People who've really been off world. Not just on uh, alien spacecraft, but actually on uh, man made spacecraft, right? And then what you do is you look for a patterned data correlation. Okay, Sally, way over here. In Dallas, Texas, she's describing things that uh, Tiffany up here in upstate New York have descri- has described to me. They don't know each other, right? They don't you know, really have similar backgrounds, but they're talking about kind of the same things. So I make a point of that. I, pay, I notate that. Okay, well, that's a pattern data correlation. Because sometimes, just like any good detective, any intelligence analyst, you have to start making educated guesses. You have to start. Uh, you have to start using your intuitive gifts, allied with the available information, anecdotal. It doesn't matter, and then start to create a picture. And that's my approach, and that's why I feel that in this field. A lot of people come to me as a source and for more understanding because I have developed a certain level of gravitas and integrity in the field. And I listen to these people when they come to me because some of these people, they really need someone to talk to. So I'm not going to sit there and interrupt them over and over and over when I'm, I'm supposed to understand them. And that's the problem with a lot of people in this field, the podcasters and people that are unlistenable because they, they call themselves interviewers, but they're constantly interrupting the, the, the guests. They're constantly yakking, right? Just just throwing the inter- the guest out of kilter because of the constant interruptions. Some people are just absolutely unlistenable. And I'm, I'm not going to spin my wheels listening to them either. So the point I'm making here is what I just described, how I present information about the so-called secret space program, which I don't even like that term. It's been popularized by the, uh, you know, the yellow lantern hexagonal uh, um, alliance types, right? I don't even like that term, but for simplicity's sake, the secret space program, when, when I describe it, I give it in bite-sized chunks, give the information in a way that's not only understandable, but quite plausible. And then you start adding in the anecdotal information from people who you feel intuitively you know are telling you the truth, right? And you also have to check the witnesses for signs of grandiosity and confabulation. Because a good witness will say, oh, well, that's all I remember, that experience. I don't remember much more. They're not going to confabulate. They're not going to fill in all the blanks and say, oh, this happened and that happened. And then, then I, you know snuck on board this uh, Draco flagship and I destroyed it and right I'm sure some of that stuff does happen because some of the information I've gotten from some my labs that have been involved in these deep space ops they get utilized in some of these these covert combat ops right but you have to judge each witness on his or her own terms and try to determine just how much confabulation is there, how much grandiosity is there, how much ego is there, how much ego has been activated. And then you begin to grade them, right? Quite frankly, you have to. You have to determine a grading system, who, which people are more credible and have more information than others. Some people that I grade very, very high as my lab witnesses, paradoxically, don't have as many memories as others do. But that still does not detract from the fact that they've had real experiences. They've experienced exactly what they've described. They don't confabulate. They don't fill in the blanks and and you know weave out a whole cloth all these stories. Usually them at the epicenter. Usually them the hero or the heroine. 
in, in the story. Because I'll, I'll tell you, some of these, these MyLabs, I'm just going off on a MyLab tangent to make this point, I just don't take them seriously. They've tried to dumb it down to the point where what they're describing sounds very much like all the movies we've been seeing about deep space mining operations, et cetera, et cetera, which I've described. Okay, so there's an example of my approach to making something that would be considered woo-woo in most circles, i.e. the secret space program, and breaking it down in digestible bite-sized chunks that has a high degree of plausibility and probability. Okay, getting back to the esoteric messiahs, the esoteric preachers, one thing you will know about these people right off the bat is their worldview is fairly limited. You cannot have a mundane conversation with them. Oh, Steve, it's like, uh, what do you think of this hot weather we've been having? Jeez, it's been weeks now. When's it going to cool off? Uh Uh-uh. None of that. Hey, Steve, uh, what do you think of that new Thai restaurant there at the shopping mall? None of that. When you're in Steve's presence you are automatically part of what i call steve tv and you can just transpose any name for these people okay uh tanya tv eleanor tv uh, frank tv whatever the name of the esoteric messiah you're in their tv reality show you're in their energetic field so there's none of this, yeah, you know, um, what did you think of this? Uh, you know, how's the weather? How's your family? How's your kids? No, it's a constant drumbeat of their messianic message. And again, it goes back to this esoteric spiel. In the guise of wanting to help others break out of this matrix control system, they will just hammer you relentlessly with their their religious dogma because that's what it amounts to. It, it, it's a religion to them. So whatever you may be interested in, whatever facet of esoterica or uh, investigations into the control systems here on the surface and extending outward in the solar system, et cetera, et cetera, All they know about you, all they care about you, is you have an interest, even from their standpoint, a tangential interest in these subjects. And that's the inroad they're looking for. And so once you get around them, it could be, oh, you get around them initially for lunch, maybe you meet at a conference, maybe you're introduced by mutual friends. What happens is, once you get in their field, you become part of their TV show. And they begin the process, the, the constant drumbeat of hammering you with their message. And even if you were to manage to get a word in edgewise and speak for oh, no more than 30 or 40 seconds, what will happen is right after you finish talking, they will just take off on another tangent as if they never even heard you speak. And that's the point. Because in the overall scheme of things, you are someone they want to convert. Uh, Prior to to them meeting you, you're just an interference pattern. Uh, you're You're not even an abstraction. You're just someone they can convert. So they don't care about you, although they can smile on your face, hug you, tell you how much they love you, how much they respect you and your work. But really, they don't. Because they don't respect you, they don't, they don't have time for you to talk about the things that are important to you, whether it's mundane chit-chat uh, or it's more deeper issues. No, you're there to listen and to shut up. So you're in their presence, and even if you're only around them for a half hour, you'll just get the steady drumbeat of the the religious esoteric spiel and again i pointed out earlier it's a very contrarian viewpoint they have where because of this sense of superiority and this grandiosity 
and the energy, oftentimes reptilian energy they exude, because in truth, entities are working through them because it is an agenda. The other aspect of pacification I mentioned earlier is outright slaughter, because that's a euphemism that, you know, the CIA and black ops use. Oh, they pacified this area, which basically means they laid waste to it. And a lot of times before they do that, they'll send in the cords administrators, they'll send in the, you know, the engineers that dig the wells and stuff, but just really just to prep the people. So anyway, what happens is you're in the presence of these people, even if it's only for a half hour, and it's supposed to be just a quick cup of coffee, a quick bite to eat. How how are you? How's the family? And once the pleasantries are out of the way, then it's back to all the esoteric uh, drumbeat, the constant hammering of their information. And their twist on all the subjects is uniquely their own, and everyone is wrong about all these subjects. Whether it's AI, whether it's uh, the New World Order, whether it's uh, the concept of, you know, the Earth being part of the Moon-Saturn matrix control system, etc., etc., etc. There's always a counterpoint. There's always a reason why that's wrong and they're right. And so there's no let up with these people. It's, you're in their field, it's... Uh, Tony TV, it's Tiffany TV, whatever you want to call it. And there's absolutely no let up because of the programs and sub-programs driving them and their inability to exert self-control and self-discipline. They just give vent to all these impulses working through them, and then it just becomes a free flow, this constant diarrhea of the mouth, constant repetition of the same themes over and over and over. And you've heard of this kind of thing before. It's, this is cult-like behavior, folks. This is, this is what they do in cults, okay? They just constantly hammer you with the same message, isolate you from the outside world, and imply that, you know, they're the ones that are right, everyone else is wrong. And, and that's a big call in our field, right? Because truth, as I've said many times before, is the most subjective thing. What's truth to one person is just outright lunacy to another person. Is truth something tangible? Is it something you can hold in your hand? Or is it something that is uh, doesn't require a physical, tangible proof? Is it something that uh, we can come to an understanding of a given truth through uh, empirical studies, whatever the case may be. So the term truth, it's, it's a very loaded, subjective term. But one thing you'll, you'll get from these people, these esoteric messiahs, these esoteric preachers, is that their truth is the only truth. Everyone else in the field is wrong. And I've even seen this with people who I consider to be well-meaning people. It's, again, their outlook, their their perception on life is so limited. I mean, you can't talk to them about mundane things. And sometimes it's a relief not to talk about this stuff, folks. You know what I mean? I mean, some of the most engaging, uh, memorable discussions I've had with people were about sports, were about history. I love nothing more than talking to a knowledgeable baseball fan going back to the 70s and 60s or talking to a knowledgeable basketball fan about the, the glory days of the Boston Celtics with Larry Bird and the L.A. Lakers with Magic Johnson, the great battles they had in the NBA Finals, the, you know, the 1992 Dream Team, right? Uh, Olympic team with all those great Hall of Famers on one team. Today's basketball, folks, to me is unwatchable. I can't watch it. It's just playground stuff. In the old days, they had real basketball, real court sense, real movement away from the ball, real always making the extra pass. That I can't watch today's game. So when I come across someone from the old days who, who knows what real basketball was all about, I get a kick out of those conversations. It's a relief to talk about things that are pleasant to me and bring back good feelings and feelings of contentment and harmony from my past, whatever it may be about. Likewise, if I come across somebody who's really knowledgeable about certain aspects of military history and we get into a really deep conversation 
uh, you know, bereft of all this stuff about oh, well, the causes of the war, what's really behind it, yada, 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 because I already have a good idea about that. I don't need to bring that into the equation. I don't need to assert my moral superiority by knowing more than the other person. You see, because a lot of this ego activation grandiosity is, oh, look at me, I'm talking nonstop about esoteric things. Look at how knowledgeable I am. Look at how special I am. Look how I'm teaching everybody. Look, look at how I'm making such a huge difference, right? And these people need to check their egos at the door. So when I come across another person who's quite knowledgeable about World War II history, American Civil War history, whatever, you know, I engage them on those terms. And I have a really enjoyable discussion uh, as a result. And so it's a pleasant distraction for me. It's a pleasant diversion for me. And this could apply in, in all walks of life and all different interests, fishing and, you know, hiking, camping. There's always something that you can relate to in another person, whether they're aware of any of this stuff or not. There's too much of this elitism in our field, like, oh, I know things and you don't know things. You're part of the problem, yada, 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 right? And it's, it also relates to how people try to, quote, educate others. How can you possibly hope to undo a lifetime's worth of programming in somebody in a five-minute discussion or less? You can't do it. If the person expresses a real interest and a sense of misgiving about, you know, the world just isn't what it's cracked up to be and, you know, people, the rich get richer, the poor get poor, etc., you meet people at their needs. You meet them at that level and you do it without a sense of superiority, right? Oh, well, yeah, you know, this financial system, it's uh, there's a lot of about it that people really aren't aware of and which they don't talk about in the media. Here, go to this website, Zero Hedge. Go to this website. This one will tell you about the, you know, the monetized debt system. And just leave it at that. I'm not going to blow that person out of the water talking about reptilian shapeshifters and secret space programs. You just blow the person out of the water. You're not meeting them at their needs. Okay, You're just allowing self-indulgence to creep in and a sense of innate superiority again. And that's what happens with these esoteric messiahs. They have no sense of proportion of regulating their spiel to suit a particular social situation. Even in mixed company, they are always ready to start blurting this stuff out. They have no sense of proportion. They have no self-restraint. They are always ready to start giving their spiel, giving their, throwing their rap, as we used to say. No ability to contract their zeal and their enthusiasm. They lack the means to throttle back a couple of notches and modify their discussion, because they will be talking. No two ways about that. Modify the, to the topics and the subject matter to a given setting. They can't do that, right? Like, there's certain subjects I don't discuss around certain people. Either they, I feel they don't have a need to know, or, you know, quite frankly, they lack the intellectual capacity and intuitive understanding to understand the kind of things that, uh, you know, that I'm familiar with. So I'm not going to sit there and be this boorish, esoteric messiah and talk nonstop about subjects that, frankly, they're not interested in, could care less about, and don't even believe in. And yet... Because these people that I'm describing, they have no sense of uh, what it's like to interact on a familiar basis with quote-unquote normal people. It's like, if there's normal people in the mix, and it, it's a mixed societal setting, a mixed social setting, it doesn't matter. You're going to get Tony TV, you're going to get Tiffany TV, you're going to get Esoteric TV, whether anyone wants to talk about it or not. It's one long, never-ending infomercial with these people. It's just a constant program that runs in these people. Uh, some of them have amassed quite a large following on the internet, on YouTube, and it's very cleverly packaged because they it can manifest an affability, a likability, uh, ability to dis have a disarming effect on the listeners smile a lot, laugh a lot, laugh at themselves. But this is where in, intuition comes in. This, comes, this is where the ability to discern comes in, where you can see through all that. 
and filter it out and tune in to the the energy behind it and the intent behind it and then as you listen because as time goes on the agenda within them kicks in and then they begin to put out the spiel that you know they want you to take on board and one of the most common ones and i keep talking about this is well we've already won the war has been won uh the dark lords have lost it doesn't seem that way to me not when they're teaching grade school kids uh, the importance of uh, being transgender and that there's counselors uh, on staff that are uh, browbeating these kids in, into accepting hormone, uh, sexual hormone uh, therapy treatments you know, without the parents' knowledge. Okay, that doesn't sound to me like the war has been won. It doesn't sound to me that, like, that the war has been won when this technocratic control grid has been firmly embedded uh, you know, what Snowden talked about was just the tip of the iceberg. It's all across the board, the cultural Marxism, the social engineering, the rage that's being released in, in the form of the waves of the immigrant rape invasion, all across the board. You're just turning loose so many of these frankly low IQ, uh, misogynistic, rapacious predator types. You're just turning them loose on, on polite society. And I'm just supposed to think that we've already won, that, you know... All we got to do is put our feet up and kick back and then go on a permanent champagne cruise, have a hallelujah breakdown because we don't have to work anymore. And that's the underlying message. Relax, you know, just check your worries at the door. Just relax because, you know, it's all over but the shouting. We've won. Okay, pacification. This is what I talked about at the outset. Pacification. To pacify. Right? I'll tell you what will happen. It's going to be, as Wellington said, after uh, the Battle of Waterloo against Napoleon, he was asked about the battle. He said it was, a, it was a very close run thing. It was a very close run thing. Pivotal battle in history, Waterloo. And the point of relevance is when some of us break out of this paradigm, this soul harvesting, soul recyclement, harvesting Saturn moon matrix system, it will be a very close run thing and not everybody is going to break out there's this notion that oh we're all just going to ascend we're just going to leave our cares behind ain't going to happen and where's the fairness and justice of that if you have all these people around you that are thoroughly embedded in the matrix that are part of the problem in a very real sense they're part of the control system simply by dinner the fact that they have given their minds away and they always defer to authority figures to do their thinking for them. Why, why, in the name of justice and humanity, is it okay for them to break out of this, this prison matrix when they were part of the problem and they've made no efforts at working on themselves and helping others? There's no fairness in that. There's no justice in that. It shouldn't be like that. So there's only going to be a certain small percentage of people who break out. That's just the way I see it. And, and, and I hate to say it, but this notion that we're all going to break out, that's Pollyanna. And that's part of the manipulation process. That's basically in line with the whole, we've already won. Let's just all go on a permanent champagne cruise. Because that's one of the messages that some of these esoteric messiahs, esoteric preachers are spewing out. We've already won. We don't need to fight anymore. We can stop writing articles. We can stop blogging. We can stop giving lectures. We can stop doing interviews. It's a contradictory message, too, because if it's already been done, if we've already won, if it's already uh, all over but the shouting, then why are these esoteric messiahs still giving lectures? Why are they still giving workshops? Why are they still giving interviews? Why are they still preaching? and trying to convert others. And when I mean convert, I mean convert. And you know, I've been in the field long enough, 26 years and counting, and that doesn't include the decades worth of research before I became, quote unquote, a UFO researcher. And the only reason I became an active UFO researcher in the early 90s was I got sick of all the Muppets back then, you know, that would just gang up on people that would talk about a negative uh, ET experience. This was a the very dawn of the internet age. And even before the internet came along, I was coming across that. 
where if you said you had a negative, painful, frightful ET experience, uh, you were branded as a, you know, spiritual retard, a, a vibrationally challenged, right? I just got sick and tired of that. And, and then when I met Dr. Carla Turner, that was like a revelation to me, an epiphany. It's like, oh, it, it's okay for me to feel this way about it, right? It took this little four foot six inch woman from Arkansas to kick me in the ass to make me feel this way, that it's okay for me to have misgivings about this. I don't have to go along with all these people who are trying to tell me all this alien abduction abuse is for my own good. And when Candy comes along and tells me that, no, it's not good, they shouldn't be doing this to you, she gave me permission to be myself. And I'll always be thankful for that. Because then I can just chuck all these misgivings, chuck all the the, the hindrances and, and all this other stuff that was going on right out the window and just be myself and just do my own research. So I became an active researcher in the early 1990s. But again, I've been researching this for decades on my own because I already had an interest in the subject. Little did I know how closely connected I was to it on a personal deep soul level. So when someone comes along to try to convert me, I play the game up to a point. Uh, there's a term, uh, white face, black heart. And kind of, in a nutshell, it means that, you know, you can smile, you can go along and, and seem to go along and seem to be a team player, but you really know that the the whole thing is a ruse, the whole thing is BS. That, you know, ultimately, you're going to go your own way, you're going to do things the way you've always done them. It's kind of like at the embassy cocktail parties where you have the receiving line and, and then all the dignitaries, all the guests, they all come in, they shake hands, and, and then they break up into little groups in you know the, the cocktail hour. And basically what you have are spies trying to pick the brains of other spies. They teach them how to do this in people places like Defense Language Institute in, uh, in Monterey and in other spy, spy uh, finishing courses where they teach you how to go to these embassies and you know, smile and hobnob and nod and act interested. But all you're really trying to do is pick the brains of the other person and the other person is trying to do the same to you, right? And you do it with a smile on your face, tippy-tappy in your heart. And so that's what I do. Someone tries to convert me, yeah, you know, nod, and oh, that sounds interesting. Oh, wow, I never thought of that, right? And then that just gets their ego going more and more and they just keep talking and talking. Ultimately, what usually happens... And this is so juvenile, I can't believe they, they still make these approaches towards me. Because it's happened more than once. Again, I've been in this field for a long time now. And, and I, I came up in the field in Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, that whole tri-state uh, desert southwest region. So that was like a real crucible training ground, right? And, the, and then I liaised closely for many years with Barbara Bartholick in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So uh, I, I was able to have her as someone that I can brief and be debriefed by about some of the experiences I had with all the entity-infested people in Southern California UFO scene. Anyway, gradually what happens over time is, like I said, they try to convert you. And in my case, invariably, invariably, they want me to stop talking about reptilians invariably they want me to stop talking about the soul harvesting soul recyclement uh saturn moon matrix which which david ike uh did so much to popularize the concept of the saturn moon matrix which i think is there's absolutely something to that absolutely so really it, it's a conversion effort it's it's like i'm the pagan and the esoteric missionary is the converter and i'm going to be converted to their way of thinking because, you know, talking about reptilians is scary. We don't want to scare these people. We've already won anyway. I mean, why do we have to scare these people? Why do we have to talk about reptilians? Why do we have to talk about, you know, these manis beings doing all this hyperdimensional manipulation and, you know, leeching all this loosh off of us uh, through all the misery they create in our lives? And, you know, we don't really need to talk about that because it's so negative. Ultimately, so you see this transition where they act like they're talking about all this hardcore stuff and it's part of their spiel, you know? Oh, I battled the Draco, I did this, I did that, and, and, you know, mixed in with all the esoteric jargon. Later on, it's like, once the pacification process is set in, they'll, they'll say to me, uh, you know, you shouldn't talk about reptilians anymore, really. I mean, it, it's time to move on. You've, you've talked about for, that for too long, James. And, and, and it's, it's like, you know, yeah, this is my first barbecue, you know. 
when I, I grew up, essentially, in the Southern California scene, which was a cosmic zoo, I might add, right? <laughs> the kind of characters and critters that you run into down there. I used to have blonde-haired women walk up to me at these conferences, and I kid you not, they would say things like, Hi, I'm a Pleiadian hybrid walk-in. And I'd think, gee, how do I respond to that? I'm, I'm Elvis's dead tour manager, Colonel Tom Parker. And I mean... I mean, these are the kind of people you ran into back back then, and still do in some places. So, just to recap, okay, this is the esoteric messiah, the esoteric messenger, the esoteric uh, preacher who is uh, going around converting the pagans, basically. And they have a religious zeal, uh, they use a lot of esoteric jargon, much of which they created on their own, and they invoke all of these rules where you shouldn't be using certain terms, you shouldn't be saying certain things because you are playing their game, you're uh, allowing yourself to be binded to all these uh, esoteric soul agreements, etc., etc. And everyone else in the field is wrong, they are right. Everyone is using the wrong terms, saying the wrong things. It's a steady drumbeat. It's esoteric TV. It's Steve TV, Tiffany TV. It's reinforcement, it's mind control. And it's a long, never-ending infomercial. You will never spend a minute of time with these people when they're not preaching. It just It's not in their programming. The entities working through them, the programming they have working through them, it ain't going to happen. You're not going to sit there and have a mundane conversation about the weather. So forget about it. They have an automatic assumption, assumption of superiority. They have this unholy compulsion to preach to you and assume they know more than you. So you may get a word in edgewise, but they'll just bat it aside and then they'll just keep talking and talking and talking. Because they don't care about you or your knowledge or your wisdom. You're there to be converted. You are a heathen pagan. And they will hit on all the hot button topics. Everything that's trending in our field. Black goo, AI, aliens, New World Order, chemtrails, Bitcoin, whatever is trending, they've got that mixed up in their spiel. But ultimately, uh, some of the more agenda-oriented themes come out because they want to pacify the converted. They want to pacify the listeners through constant repetition constant repetition a common theme now is the war has been won the dark lords have lost the real message being we can all relax there's no more work to be done and it's a very pernicious insidious message and ultimately they want to convert you so you know combined with the energy they exude the uh, constant uh, drumbeat the hypnotic mesmerizing uh, same messages over and over because they repeat themselves endlessly, folks. These people repeat themselves endlessly. And the thing about it is, I've said this before, but it bears repeating. If you're in their presence and there is people there that they haven't attempted to convert before, they will throw the whole rap on them. And you will hear the exact same uh, themes, the exact same spiel, that you've been subjected to time and again, they will just turn around and they will just apply it to someone else because they have no self-control, they have no sense of proportion, and they never stop to ask themselves, well, is this person even interested in this stuff? No, it doesn't matter because they're working towards a program, entities driving the, the message through them, and they're exuding all this energy. So for people that are unprepared, they can get caught in a blast of all this. And then they let their guard down. Oh, tell me more. Yeah, do you have a website? And, and it just goes on from there, right? So, and, and, you know, like I said, paradoxically, you know, the war is over. There's no more work that needs to be done. Yet they're still giving workshops. They're still, you know, doing consults. They're still doing interviews. They're still doing vlogs, video blogs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very contradictory message. It's the esoteric infomercial, which never ends, a steady drumbeat. It's reinforcement, it's entrainment, it's mind control. And 
all the elements of a cult mind control are there. You know, you're not supposed to speak a certain way. You're supposed to use certain terms, and they will utilize the jargon, and they will utilize these these terms over and over and over because they want you to start using their terms. Because once you start using their terms and uh, start to view things from their perspective, and they feel they've got you, and and then they can just go and mold you and you know any way they want after that. So anyhow. I thought it was important that I should talk about esoteric infomercials, esoteric messengers, messiahs, preachers, basically. So I hope that's helpful to you. You will find many people on the field that are doing this. And remember, folks, just because a YouTube channel has garnered a lot of views, that doesn't mean anything. Some of the people out there that are just spewing out utter drivel and nonsense have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views and you have to ask yourself are hundreds of thousands of people really going to sit and listen and watch all this so again it comes down to discernment trusting your own intuition trusting in yourself and knowing that you have a destiny to fulfill and not putting people up on pedestals and allowing them to exert a sense of moral superiority over you and always remember that your viewpoints, your perspectives, your knowledge base is as important as anyone else's. And you don't have to take a backseat to anyone. But at the same time, we need to remain humble. We need to remain centered and heart-centered. Because otherwise, we become one of those esoteric preachers, uh, UFO preachers, UFO messengers. And we don't want to do that. Uh, we want to meet people at their needs. We want to uh, uplift, encourage you know, those around us who, you know, are coming to grips with the reality of all this in their lives, right? We don't want to be a source of, uh, of anxiety, of fear, uh, apprehension. You know, we want to lead by example that, hey, yeah, we can know all this stuff, but we can comfortably assimilate it, let, let it wash, you know, off our backs like, you know, water off a duck's back, recognize the reality of the env environment we're in, and in the process of doing something about it, still live contented, happy, joy-filled lives. And, and that's another thing that Barbara Barthel used to always, always tell me. You know, one of the best ways to get back at these negative entities is just have joy in your life. Just have contentment and gratitude and appreciation for all the things that you do have instead of dwelling on what you don't have. Because when we get ourselves into that energetic state, in that heart-centered state, uh, the they, these entities, they lose their power over us. They really do, okay? So anyhow, folks, that's this week's segment of Bartley's commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, have a very pleasant time, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. <laughs> Because this is a frequency war.